everybody at home. Um, ignore this title for now. I'm just borrowing the blank, sl blank slide so I can draw it so you can see. Um, I was talking about, we accidentally got to talking about credit the other day, kind of thing. So here's the thing. Um, your credit score is, is, is a measure of the likelihood that you're going to pay money back. Because Haley is deciding she's going to lend money to me or lend money to Dr. Roberts. She's going to look at who does she think has a better chance to pay her back. And indications of how good a chance they have to pay her back are how good of a job have I done paying back the people that I owe already? And how much do I owe other people? If I'm already in debt up to my eyeballs, then maybe she's not going to want to lend me money. Even though I do a good job of paying back the people I owe, but if I owe a bunch of people, maybe she still doesn't want to. Whereas Dr. Roberts, he, he does a good job paying, but he doesn't owe as many people. That's it. So how many people you owe factors into your reliability, your, your credit score. Is it, your credit score is just the number where they sort of try to give you a point score to, on how, rely, how good of a customer you would be. How many people you owe, how much you owe them, how good of a job you do paying them. And the, how much you owe them is in relation to your income. Like in the mortgage industry, we look at, you don't want a debt to income ratio of 50%. If you owe more than 50% worth of your income, you're going to start having problems borrowing money. So if you make $50,000 a year, if you've got more than $25,000 worth of debt, well, your loan payments, if you make $50,000 a year and your, pay, your payments add up to being more than $25,000, Got problems. Okay, so those are the things that go into play. So what you need to do for those of you that are young and you're like, well, I don't have any proof that I'm reliable. I uh, will be reliable paying people back because nobody's giving me credit. You're 16, you're 17, you're 18. You can't you get a credit card. You can't buy a car or anything like that. Your parents think that would be on that kind of thing. So. Here's a stunt that you can pull, and I'm going to sort of come back around to the other thing. Is oh, secret number two is for credit card. A credit card will not charge you interest if you pay them off on time each month. It's once that payment comes past is when they start charging interest. So what you can do to increase the number of payment streams you have on your credit report is y'all are college students. A lot of you, with the exception apparently of Jenny, we decided the other day. Um, a lot of you, the, your, your college students, credit card companies are sending you stuff in the mail. If you haven't gotten it yet, once you start transferring, you could be getting these credit card offers in the mail. For you, for college students, they may only give you like a thousand dollars credit line or something like that. That's most of the charge. But they want to get your books in you now because what do they expect? You don't have money now, right? What are you going to have three or four years ago? A good paying job, right? And they want to have that relationship with you. So you had a chance to get a credit card now. And so what you do is you can improve your credit score without spending an extra penny. Get that credit card and only use it for one thing. Use it to pay a bill you already pay. Like your cell phone bill, your cable bill, something like that. You were already paying that $60 a month or whatever. Well, instead of you writing the check and sending it to Verizon, you pay the credit card. I mean, you pay the Verizon bill with the credit card, and then you write the check to the credit card company. And if you make sure you pay that credit card payment on that, well, guess what? Your cell phone bill is never going to be late because you set it up on an automatic payment, right? So you don't have to worry about getting cut off by a Verizon. But then you pay off that credit card company every time. You're still spending $60 a month, but your credit report is going to be showing on time, on time, on time for Verizon, on time, on time, on time for credit card. So you get two payments, two records of, hey, this person does a good job of paying their debts instead of just one. So that's a little way you can get. And do you start that credit card? It is not for emergency. Take that credit card, stick it in the dresser drawer somewhere. You never let it leave your house because you don't want to use it for anything else except to improve your credit. What do you need to do for emergencies? Save some money for emergencies. Come up with a little, you know, a rainy day fund. You save money. The money you're saving is earning interest, 
And then you have that money that you're saving earning interest when things go sideways, you've got the money to pay for it. Instead of when things go sideways, then you gotta borrow money and pay interest. You gotta you need a new tire on your car, that's the emergency. Well, you take a hundred dollars out of your savings account that's been earning interest however long, score. That tire costs you less than hundred dollars. You can put less than hundred dollars in the savings account. Right? But if you don't have the money, put it on a credit card, you buy that tire for hundred dollars, and then you pay interest on it until you pay it all back. Don't use credit card for emergency. Set yourself up an emergency fund just, just in case. Now, the other thing I'm going to say on the credit, and then I'm going to try to cut this short. We'll go into more on this in the 202 I'm not sure. Is don't. Well, be careful on skipping a payment. Oh, Amanda is over here. She's saying, well, um, I don't have the money to pay my October car payment. Well, I'm going to skip my October car payment. But then now it's November. She's going to write a check and she's going to say, well, this is October payment. Well, here's my November payment. But what ends up happening is the way the car company is going to look at it is that checks you wrote in November, that was paying for October payment. 30 days late. So that's counted as late. And then her sister's saying, well, where's my November payment? And then she writes a check in December. Well, that's just her November payment, 30 days late. Then to January, that's just the December, 30 days late. They're looking for 12 payments a year. And you can't do these stuff of, well, if my payment is 300 bucks this month, well, I'm going to pay 600 this month, and then I get to take next month off. No. Okay, so you're going to say, that's $600. Well, it's nice you got ahead of the game, but we're looking for another payment 30 days later. So don't skip a payment. It's better to not make the full payment than to skip. If you can't make the full payment, pay as much as you can. If you can't make the 300 payment, pay this month, pay 200 of it. Pay 100 of it. It shows that you're trying. It shows you're not ignoring them. They're going to charge you that extra interest, but they're going to be heck of a lot more forgiving. Then uh, they completely blew us off this month. You don't want to have that happen. Don't skip a payment. It's a beautiful thing if you can pay ahead, but make sure that you can make the payments in on schedule. They're looking for 12 years. So that's just a little freebie for building your credit. There's some other stuff we can talk about, but we're like insanely behind this semester, so we're not going to talk about any more of it, I hope. I'm dreaming, but okay. Uh, any questions on that? I should be looking forward to questions. Y'all go with it? I mean, that's just a strategy to do it. Okay. So. We have been talking, we were talking last, whatever that day was, Tuesday. Um, fiscal policy, this is the government changing to how much they're going to spend, changing how much they're going to take out away from us and our spending in terms of taxes in order to change the economy. And we were talking about <laughs> the, the spending that they do on purpose. It's a discretionary, it's a decision. We're choosing how much we can spend on bullets, we're choosing how much we can spend on butter, we're choosing how much we can spend on balloons. And Buffalo and other things we know that are being fresh. They're making the choice. But there's non discretionary spending, things that happen automatically. And I hinted at these the other day. The government doesn't know how much they're going to be, how much the value of their unemployment checks are they going to write this month. They don't know how many people are going to be out of, month, out of work this month. If the economy gets worse, well, they're going to be writing much more unemployment checks. If the economy gets better, they're going to be writing much fewer unemployment checks. But those things, they're rules that are built in, they happen automatically. If you have a job, you lose your job, you show up at the Employment Security Commission, they give you money automatically. So a lot of times these non-discretionary things, they call them automatic stabilizers because they tend to work in the opposite direction of the economy. If the economy is slowing down, Oh, just so oh, uh, we'll just stick with unemployment benefits for the example here. The economy is slowing down. People are losing their jobs. Well, something automatically happens is the government is going to be giving out more money, right? Which is helping to speed up the economy that's slowing down. So uh, it's 
But it, it doesn't offset it, so it just slows down and slow down. Because if you collect unemployment, they're only going to give you about half of what you were making when you were working. So when the economy is slowing down, these things are going to help slow down and slow down. When the economy is going too fast, or going fast, these are going to be tending to automatically try to slow things down a little bit. If the economy is growing and all of you have jobs, none of you getting unemployment checks, well, guess what? The government's trying to get your unemployment checks. So C plus I equals B plus X. G went down because the government's not writing as much unemployment checks. All right. So G goes down, but we're okay with that because C and I are going up because the economy is improving and we all have jobs now. Right. So when one thing is causing the economy to go up, these things may be causing it to slow down a little bit. When the economy is slowing down, these things are automatically going to be causing it to try to speed up at the same time. The metaphor that I've used is a parachute out the back of like a dragster or a race car or something like that. If you're going two miles an hour, how much wind resistance is that a parachute going? Nothing. It's just dragging the ground. But if you're doing 100 semi miles an hour, the wind resistance is a lot stronger. The faster you go, the harder the parachute is working to try to slow you down. Right? But the power of the engine, the power of the engine is stronger than the power of the parachute, right? But it but the parachute is working harder to try to slow you down the faster you're going. So Tax. If the government is trying to speed up the economy, um, well, they just no, no, the uh, just, uh, like I said, these are non-discretionary. So this is not the what we're trying to speed up the economy. Here's the thing: you make more money, you get a pay raise. What happens? That's right. More of it goes in Uncle Sam and Aunt Jenny's pocket, right? The more money that goes in your pocket. Uh, it pay raises and stuff, the more money they're going to be taking away from you. That is the parachute on the back of the drags. Unemployment benefits, the more people lose work, the more money the government's going to spend. Welfare benefits, the more people that lose work, stay out of work, or end up being poor, the more money the government's going to be spending to keep them on their feet. Interest rates, as we're spending more, the economy's speeding up. Money is becoming more valuable because, or less valuable because of inflation, which means interest rates are going to be going up, which means, yeah, the economy's cooking, but darn, I can't afford to borrow money at 12% interest rate. So you have these things, that they, they, these adjustments tend to happen automatically because there's rules in place about who, what, what the rules you have to qual do to qualify for unemployment benefits, what rules you qualify to do to give welfare benefits. Just Normal economic behavior that Haley was going through as far as interest rates when she's lending money to people in the face of inflation. Just tax these things happen automatically because there's rules in place. So politically, we've been talking we talked about the whole idea of we're trying to the government is still monkeying around to try to mess with the economy. Speed it up if it's going too slow, slow it down if it's going too fast. So they're aiming for stability. That's the word here. Their discretionary policies are we're consciously making a decision to bring things more stable. Their automatic stabilizers are automatically bringing stability. <coughs> stability was only one of those eight economic goals the first week of class. But politically, there's some issues there. Politically, some people are like, I value freedom. Freedom is more important than stability. I value fair, and fair distribution of income is more important than stability. Um, the, so you have opinions, politics coming into play here about the, what has Donald Trump been saying about the Federal Reserve here lately? He ain't happy with that. Because he's like, they're, they're trying to slow things down. I'm trying to get the economy speeding up, and they're trying to slow things down. Because his thinking about what he thinks the economy should be doing is different than what the Federal Reserve is thinking the economy should be doing. And we'll talk more about the Federal Reserve and monetary policy chapter coming soon for pleasure here. And here's the next one. State and local governments may have balanced budget rules that disagree with what the federal government is thinking. Here's the story. The economy's in trouble. So we, the United States government, Uncle Sam is going to pull off his beard, rip open his jacket, and pull out his Superman shirt, and he's going to come out and take a polar horse. 
the economy is slowing down, well, we're going to borrow money and do extra spending to keep you from losing your job. Remember we talked about that the other day. We're, so we, uh, me, Uncle Sam, I'm going to borrow money. We, the government, need to increase the G because the C and the I are going down. So we're going to increase G, and in order to increase G, we're going to end up borrowing money. We're going to go in debt to keep y'all from getting screwed. But Aunt Virginia, I said, uh, sorry, y'all, we've got rules that say we have to have a balanced budget. We can only spend what we bring in. And as people are losing their jobs, because I'm wondering, going, what are they not going to be doing? Paying taxes. So what happens to Aunt Virginia's income? It's down. So what does she have to do? Cut her spending. At the time, Uncle Sam is saying, we got to spend more, we got to spend more, and genius over here saying, oh, we've got to spend less. So not only now does the federal government have to do this borrowing and extra spending to make up for the lack of spending you and I are doing because we've lost our jobs, but now Uncle Sam has to borrow even more money to make up for the reduction spending that the Virginia State government is doing, that the South Hill Town Council is doing, and so on. Because this Virginia government doesn't answer to the North to the United States government. They're two independent governments. North Carolina government doesn't answer to the federal government. The federal government can't tell the Virginia government what to do. The federal government can't tell the North Carolina government what to do. They're two separate groups. It's like, I can't tell your kids what to do. Because I ain't your parents. You are, right? I'm theoretically an adult, you're theoretically an adult, but it don't work that way, right? So, you know, the federal government can influence the states, we've talked about this before, they'll influence the states by, you play rule, you play by our rules, and we'll give you money. Like the No Child Left Behind thing. If you play by our rules about the No Child Left Behind, and you do the this, 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 well, we'll give you money to take care of your schools. But if you don't play by our rules, what are you going to get from us? Nothing. If you don't lower your speed limits to 55 miles an hour, we ain't going to give you any money to fix your highways. That's the way the federal government influences the state governments. But they don't really play into what we have going on here in the face of a recession. So um, the federal government may end up having to get the federal government has one idea, the state and local governments may have another idea of, sorry y'all, we're hosed. Um, and then, politically, you have that crowding out that we talked about before. How do you feel about the government, that because the government is going in debt, it's going to cost you more to buy a house? Because the government's going in debt, it's going to cost you more to buy your groceries. Because interest rates are higher, inflation rate is higher, because the government is spending money that they maybe don't really need to be spending because they've got their ideas. Politically, there, there's some headaches that come along with this. Oh, those are supposed to be labeled one, two, and three. Apparently they weren't, were they? I don't know. Yeah, they weren't? Oh, okay. They're supposed to be, but I don't remember. So um, there are biases automatically built in. Congratulations, you just got elected last week. You're going to Washington, D.C. Yeah. Okay, and so now you start, you just got re, you just got elected and you already started for your election campaign two years from now. What message is going to get you reelected? I'm going to cut your taxes and put more of your money in your own pockets, or I'm going to help do increase spending so we can fix your highways, fix your schools, and give you teachers pay raises. Are people going to get reelected with that message? Those two messages? Yeah. Yeah. Well, who's going to get reelected if you say, I'm going to take money out of your pocket and I'm going to spend it somewhere else? A tax increase. Or I'm going to reduce the spending in your local schools, reduce the spending on uh, fixing the highways, that kind of thing. And teachers pay raises? Not happening. Yeah, who's going to get reelected on that campaign? Nobody. So the thing is, is, so expansionary policy is politically a whole lot easier than contractionary policy. It's easier to get reelected if you're saying, well, I'm going to cut taxes to give you more money. 
or to get reelected by saying, well, I'm going to increase spending in your area to make your life better. Those are ways that you can get reelected. So politicians, are, they're kind of, they're okay with doing that, but the, the whole, we're going to raise taxes, or we're going to cut government spending. The only time you hear people talking about cutting government spending is the Republicans say, well, we're going to cut spending and cut taxes at the same time. Otherwise, ain't nobody going to vote for them if we're just saying, well, we're taking away and we're giving you nothing in return. Then there is the political business cycle. There is a tendency for government spending to go up in the weeks and months leading up to an election. Because I want to get reelected. So one way I can get reelected is just the people in my district feel good about what's going on. So it works for me if they see the highway department out there fixing the highways. They see a work crew out there painting the school. And they see this stuff going on and they're like, hey, that scales dude is getting it done. I'll, I'll vote for him again. So there's a tendency for extra spending to happen before the election. But then what ends up happening after the election? Well, we got to pay for the spending that we just did. We did extra spending before the election, so then we got to pay for it afterwards. And what ends up happening? Well, it's going to be either an increase in tax or a reduction in spending later. But I don't care because if I get elected, score. If I don't get reelected, that's somebody else's problem, right? So there is, you can trace out if you look at the GDP over time for the nation or for you know, on a month to month basis or for a state or a local, you can see the political business cycle in action. And then I think I've told y'all before there's the idea that if you just state the obvious, you can get yourself a Nobel Prize in economics. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also the idea of you state something that has absolutely ain't going to happen. There's a guy named David Ricardo. Smarter fellow than I am, Greg. He has a Nobel Prize. I don't. But he came up with the idea. Let's see if y'all agree with this. The government says, we're going to cut you taxes. We're going to let you have more of your money. And you sit there and say, well, the government cut through taxes and they're giving me more tax money. But I know the way the government is, if they're cutting taxes now, that means sometime in the future, they're going to raise taxes again. So I'm going to be prudent and I'm going to take this tax money they gave me. It's like found couch cushion money. And I'm going to take this money and I'm going to stick it in an envelope and label it for the government. And I'm going to set it aside so that when they raise my taxes back, I've got the money and I'll be okay. Does that sound like anybody? Most people. If most people, you give me extra money, I'm gonna do what? Spend it. Spend it. Most people are like, Good. you give me extra money, I'm spending it. Because how many of you are spending all of your paycheck now? Or almost all of your paycheck now? Yeah. I need to be raising this up. Yeah, that's what we do. You give me more money, I'm gonna spend more of it. We'll talk about any econ too. I keep advertising that class, and three quarters of you are not going to be there, but but the couple of you that are, are you? I need to register. Yeah, yes, you. you but you, you were, I thought, I thought, yeah, yeah, my hero, the rest of y'all. Anyway, uh, but the Ricardian equivalence, the idea of, okay, cutting taxes isn't going to speed up the economy because there's people that are not going to spend that extra money that you're giving them because they're going to say, well, the government give it, the government take it away, and I'm just going to hold on to it for when the government g man goes knocking on the door in a year or two. We don't work that way. Nobel Prize in economics, though. Yes. 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 For that. yes. He's a smarter fellow than I am because he came up with some way to come up with something that, I mean, theoretically, there's probably out of 1% of the population that is going to think that way and act that way, but good on him. Oh, no, it, but it shouldn't be old people because I may not be alive in a couple of years when the government raises taxes. Let me spend that money. I'm not, then you see the bumper sticker, I'm spending my kids' inheritance. Yeah. That's what you do. Uh, just going back to the home loan things, there is a thing called a reverse mortgage. Usually, you are, 
Your house payment is more than to cover the interest, so the amount you owe gets smaller each month. Well, old people can do what we call a reverse mortgage, where their house payment is less than the interest per rent. So the amount they end up owing on their house, they're making a house payment, but the amount they end up owing on their house is going up each month. To allow that, they're using the value that they accumulated in this house as an asset to help them to be alive and to have a better lifestyle. Yeah. No. That's, for the, that's for the people that think of their house as being an investment. Don't think of your house as being an investment. Think of your house as that's where I'm going to live. Are you thinking of an investment? No. You, the house that you invest in is a beach house you buy. Right. Yeah. The house that you live in, that's the living in. Because it kind of would suck if you're counting on the value that my house is going to accumulate is going to be what I'm going to live off of when I retire. Well, what happens if you retire and live a long time? You might lose your house. Find other ways to save for your retirement. Talk to your financial planner and come up with the strategy. When it comes to the government saying, well, we're going to fix the economy, well, there's some problems here. And I think I accidentally talked about this before. First, it takes time to recognize that there's a problem in the first place. Technically, a recession is when the economy, the economy slows down two quarters in a row. How do you know the economy slowed down two quarters in a row? It's already happened two quarters in a row. That's six months. Before we can officially say, yeah, we got us a recession, y'all. And that's exactly what it's saying, right? So it takes time to recognize there's a problem. Once you recognize there's a problem, it takes time to figure out, well, what are we going to do about it? And come up with a plan, the administration, the paperwork that, that you got to do. And then once you come up with a plan, it takes time for that plan to work. That's operational life. For the operation, for whatever you're doing to actually work. Recognition lag. How long has that fire been going before you smell the smoke? Administrative lag. You go, you investigate, you see the smoke, and you're like, oh crap, and then you run out the back door and you hook up the garden hose and swing it around and you come to the front, right? But the fire ain't out. Look, how long does it take for the water to work once you start turning it on a spring? That's the operational lag, right? These are the three steps it takes. How long has your boyfriend been cheating on you before you start getting a hint of, hmm, maybe there's something that I need to investigate, right? And then you come up with a plan for what you're going to do to get revenge against him, and then how long is it going to take before that revenge goes into play? And next thing you know, he's out there duct taping his old post at the high school football game wearing nothing but a thong. Well, it takes five minutes to slash him. Yes, but that is as much fun, though, isn't it? Yep. Or slash three fires, and then turns his cover. Yeah, but, 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 but slashing the fire, that's a temporary, but a financial thing. But if he ends up duct taped to the goalposts or the football <laughs> field on a Friday night when lights come on or something like yeah. that, you just have some profound psychological lifetime damage there. <laughs> also, also the best part about that is that probably you weren't the only one doing it. So other people, other people had to join in on that. Yes. So, yeah. That's fine. The other girls. <laughs> <laughs> The other girl that I didn't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a posse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, why did I throw this in here? Um, all right. William Jennings Bryant history class. I can't remember why I put this in here. Uh, he did a speech trying to do cross of gold. What he's talking about is the cross of gold speech is about leaving us on the gold standard versus the our money is going to be based on the full faith and credit of the 350 million of us Americans and, and our willingness to say, yeah, we're going to pay our tax. That was what that speech was about. But he made this comment there, two ideas of government, those that believe that if you only legislate to make the rich people richer, their prosperity will leak through to those below. That's the Republicans. You do things to make rich people richer, and they're going to do what? They're going to, you know, their businesses, they're more successful, as businesses that can be creating jobs that trickles down. That's when you put money in yours, my pockets. The Democratic idea, however, has been that if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, you and I, little people, 
then our prosperity will find its way up through every class. Which is right. Yep. If, if business is better, well, the business is going to trickle down and create jobs for little people. But if little people are better off, well, they're going to be taking that money, you're going to be spending it, and it's going to be trickling up to help businesses. Republicans, Democrats, ultimately, if one, if either plan works, either plan works, and everybody who's about to do benefit. Well, either way, it's like it's the same outcome. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, it justifies the means kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, if they both work at it, would be better. Yeah, way better. Um, if you're, oh, I'm trying to come up with a metaphor. You, you can walk the Appalachian Trail. You can start on the southern end and walk to the north, or you can start on the northern end and walk to the south. Either way, you walk the trail. It's just which way you do. Uh, but you don't want to go far away and you're trying to go back, right? Because it benefits the uh, But what have, we been, what have we been doing for the last 100 and some odd years? We take a few steps, we turn around, we take a few steps, we turn around, we take a few steps, we turn around, we, turn around, we run a little bit, and then we turn around, and just that's what we do. Anyway, we did so, okay in the 20s. Huh? We did okay in the 20s. Uh, the, 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 the 20s, yes, up until 29. Minor sleep on called the Great Depression. Uh, the yeah. 40s, we did okay. Um, the 90s, we did what? The 2000s? Late 2000s, also. Yeah, yeah there. So let's call it 2004 to 2008, we did okay. We're, we've been doing okay for the last year, year and a half. Because, good. So. I'm coming back to something that we talked about before, and I'm going to kind of breeze through this because I kind of hit it already one time, and I'm just going to get it, but I'm just, there's a few, there's a little bit more meat on those bones, so I'm going to come back to you a little bit here. Because now we've talked about fiscal policy. I talked a little bit about philosophy, now I'm thinking philosophy and policy, putting it together, which is what we and Jennings Brian was doing that last one. Supply side, fiscal policy, remember this is Republicans. Their idea was, let's lower taxes. S can increase C, right? C plus I plus C plus I. Don't need that too. Oh. Lowering taxes is going to lead to more consumption because we're creating jobs and putting money in y'all's pocket. Y'all are working more hours and more of you are working and y'all get paid. And what do we do? We spend it, right? Which is why Dave Ricardo. Okay. Uh, so we have higher incomes as workers, as families, and so we got more money. Well, what are we going to do with some of it? A little of it? Maybe, I hope, save it. So there's a little bit of increase in savings. And as savings is going up, interest rates are going to be going down. Because there's more money in the banks that the banks have to lend out. So the banks don't have to say, well, we've got to pay a high interest rate in order to get y'all to give us the money that we can turn around to lend to other people. So as savings goes up, interest rates goes down. And if you're saving, then what are you not doing? Borrowing. So there's less of a demand for borrowing money. Getting for the chapter that we're probably going to skip. Interest rates are low. So the lower interest rates means it's easier, cheaper to borrow. Businesses will borrow more, more investment, and that will allow them to buy more tools and equipment. The higher incomes means more incentive to work, more and better. Yeah, I ain't that interested in going to work because the best I can do is get seven and a quarter an hour, but ooh, ten dollar an hour jobs? Okay. Fifteen dollar an hour jobs? Call me. You're actually willing to work me more than three hours a week? Okay, that's worth my time. All right. So you'll have more people willing to work, and people will be working harder and stronger. Higher productivity because we're more, we have a great, we as workers have that greater incentive to work, and then go back to that investment piece. We have more and better tools and equipment to work with. So we can work better because we use a junky, janky eight year old computer. They actually invested in the business that can bought me a new one. All right. So I can actually work without waiting 20 minutes for the thing to start up in the morning. This higher productivity means higher wages. You're making more t-shirts an hour. You're making more cookies an hour. You're assassinating more chickens an hour, which means they can pay you more an hour because they're getting more work an hour out of you. And the fact that the taxes are lower and the interest rates are lower is going to give the companies more freedom to try and experiment with new things try to do the research and development, come up with new technologies, come up with what is the next big thing. It's okay. We can experiment because we can better afford to experiment. And maybe we'll get something awesome. So, 
When the dust settles, output is going to increase a lot. A lot more is going to get made. Incomes are going to be going up faster than prices will. So as long as you're not a fixed income person, everybody's doing well here. Taxes, if we're making more money, what are we doing? We're going to pay more in taxes. So the government gets theirs. So the government, that should clean up their government debt and allow them, if they have to, to spend more money on other programs. But guess what? They won't even need to spend as much because there ain't going to be as many people collecting unemployment and welfare because there's more jobs and all that kind of stuff. All right. That's the plan there. So visually, it started with increasing aggregate supply by doing the things that we talked about lower interest rates, lower taxes, businesses are gonna be investing in that kind of stuff. And then that's gonna bring along the increase in demand as we get more money, more paychecks, that kind of stuff. And when it does settle, you get a new bigger GDP and what happens to prices? Maybe not a whole lot. That's the win, 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 win. A couple of hiccups for that plane though is, as we talked about before, it takes time. The new investment takes time. You buy a new computer, or you may have to teach somebody how to run it because it ain't running Windows XP anymore. It's got Windows 10, which is a nightmare. And you got to teach people how to use it. Right. Uh, maybe you're investing in, I don't know, a new bridge that's going to take four years for it to get built. Right. These things take time, and that increase in efficiency might actually reduce the number of workers that are needed. Because the computer's faster, because the ovens are faster, you can bake more cakes. Because the ovens are faster, the refrigerators are colder, so maybe we don't need as many chefs. All right. So we may not need as many. Maybe hopefully we can employ the same amount because we're baking more cakes for the same number of workers, but that's okay because we sell more cakes because that increases the sink. But there may not leave much room for new workers to come in. So that was that plan. Keynesians, John Maynard Keynes and Alumni were dead, right? Flashback from the uh, Keynes, this is sort of the democratic philosophy. He's like, well, tax cuts, it's, it, they, they do a beautiful thing. All that story that we just told is pretty good, but it takes too much time. So, what we need to do instead is increase G, increase government spending, make the constant decision. We, Uncle Sam and Aunt Virginia, we're going to spend more money. Uh, schools, highways, hospitals, whatever, military, building a wall at the border, whatever it is, it don't matter as long as we're spending more money. Making that conscious discretionary decision. And that is going to increase aggregate demand immediately. Because when are they buying it? Immediately. So aggregate demand is going to increase quickly, and then that's going to lead to, you know, they're buying stuff from who? Not you and me. They're buying from businesses. There's companies get the money, and since these companies are making more money, they're going to well, pay more taxes. So money is going to come from the government into the businesses, and more money is going to be coming out of the businesses back to the government. But it's still more is leaving the government than coming in, but that's going to be helping to smooth it out a little bit. But along the way, the companies are going to be, a lot of that money that companies are getting from the government, extra money is going to be going into the pockets of the workers that are making the extra stuff that the government is buying. Right. So you get more jobs, and then the more of us that are hired are going to be increasing our spending. A lot of the government spending ends up being handouts that they're giving to other people. We're going to increase grandma's social security spend. Check. That's the way to increase the we're going to increase unemployment benefits. That's the way to increase GDP. They don't have to fix a school or a highway. They can't just say, those people on SNAP, instead of getting $200 a month, we're going to give you 250 That's the way to increase GDP. Those cases, those people, extra money, they're going to spend it. Those of us that just got new jobs, we're going to spend it. Those of us that had our job, hours on our jobs increased, we're going to spend it. So ultimately, what Keynes is saying is to speed things up, we, the government, need to borrow money now and overspend in a short run to get this economy back on its feet. And then once the economy gets healthy, then we go ahead and pay back the money that we borrow. That's the plan. Borrow money now, pay it back when you get healthy. Guess what? Ain't this what we all are doing right now? Some of y'all are actually student loans, that kind of stuff. 
And you're doing it, why? Well, because your life would be like terrible if you find yourself 20, 30 years now working in the same place you're working at now, right? Unless, I mean, you want to make that career. Yeah, and unless, yeah. Yeah, well, I was assuming no ladder climbing here. So, well, yeah, the, 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 you know, I'm saying that not, if you don't get education, right. yeah. you, you want to be on the same footing as that person graduated less than you last high school. So y'all are making these sacrifice now. You're borrowing money, making less money than you could be because you ain't working 40 hours where you borrow money and you're doing extra spending, spending not only on your food and gas, but on college situation, textbooks, and that kind of crap. Now, and you're okay with that because you're gonna pay you back later. Right. So visually, we visual learners, aggregate supply. They say that shift is really too small, so you can't count on it. So you have to have a big increase in demand in order to make up for it. You get the same level of GDP growth, but you end up with higher prices that I did not have the job the line for. Canceans, faster, but higher prices. Uh, classicals or supply sider, what you get is slower prices stable. I don't think I have that on here, but okay. Well, I'll come. The, the downside, just as there was the headaches for the supply side, here's headaches for the Keynesians. First, is the government is competing with us to buy products, causes higher prices, that crowding up thing. Taxes are going to have to get raised somewhere in the future, so y'all need to embrace your inner David Ricardo and start saving now. Ooh. That's a problem, right? Because the government's trying to increase spending in order to get us spending, but then if we're like, well, we see the writing on the wall and we save it, what are we not doing? Some of that extra spending the government's hoping to get because of this. In the short term, interest rates are going to go up as well, which is actually going to limit new investment. Because businesses are going to be less likely and able to try new things because the interest rate is that much higher. So you get growth, but it's short-term growth, buying short-term stuff, food and groceries this month, as opposed to the long-term growth uh, that you get from investing in new technologies and that kind of stuff that may be paying off for 10, 20, 30 years in the future, instead of just now. So, um, I had a thought a minute ago and I postponed it, now I'm giving it to a post. Politically, what do you think that we get more of? Can't see it's a classic. I'll give you a hint. Can't see it's what we get more. Because haven't we talked about this before? What do we see every year? Prices go up every year. If it's a truly classical economics thing, thing then prices would be fairly flat. Well, part of the reason why prices are going up every year is because our population is growing, which is an interesting chunk of that increase in aggregate demand. But then the other thing is, is we want to speed up the economy. Well, I'm a politician who wants to be reelected, so what do I want to do? I'm going to speed up the economy so it's reelected. And because if I'm in Congress and I've got a reelection in two years, I can't be sitting there worrying about, well, some new technology might pay off 10 years in the future. Uh, so the, the whole political expediency of letting me get reelected causes some of the, the people that should be more hardcore conservative supply siders to say, yeah, I'll do some of this spending anyway. I, I, you, hardcore philosophies, no, you cut spending, but I'm okay with increasing spending here, there, in various places. So there is this tendency to get more of the Keynesian type. That, that's just more of the default position that we get. And so then you look at percentage of, compared to the average incomes, you look at how much Social Security benefits have gone up. They're going up faster than regular incomes do. Welfare benefits have increased more over the past years. Healthcare benefits have increased more. All that kind of stuff is happening more because there's that tendency to be doing all of these other things. So, so can you see Democrats? Yes. So uh, the old classicals, I just well, you don't write this down. No, they had the old classicals, they were like hardcore, but then they're like, well, for me, the truth is in the middle. Republicans, Democrats, classicals, Keynesians, aliens, predators. You know, the truth is in the middle. 
for open public great many things. Old class schools are like, you know, they tell the let's crank the aggregate supply, but then the new class schools are like, well, yeah, we see aggregate supply really ain't going to do a whole lot in the short term. They acknowledge that it's only going to increase by the shocks of new technology and that kind of stuff that we get. So if we ultimately, in the short run, the only thing that we're going to get is you know, uh, aggregate demand, the higher prices, kind of thing. So they're sort of saying that this is what's going on. The new, the new classicals are saying, well, did I go back? No. Um, anyway, but, but the new classicals are talking about aggregate supply and aggregate demand at the same time happening. They're, they acknowledge that. The whole canteens are saying it's so, they say technological change is so slow that aggregate supply, it ain't upward and downward, it was actually flat, but then the way I grasped it is the way the new canteens are saying, that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. The only way you can get economic growth is aggregate demand, but in reality, the new canteens are saying it's sloped upward the way I did graph it, so then you get some economic growth from supply. But don't worry about that new and old classical. I just have it there in the center that we would have like. Well, you will. Yes. But I've heard all of those now. Read over the crowd. Like $6 million. Read over the crowd. Monitorists. There's this third group. They're going to get a little bit, they're going to get a little more love when we get to the monetary policy chapter. Bless you. But monitorists. I try and decide if I really want to talk about that now. Um, okay. In a nutshell, monetarists are saying the economy is content toward equilibrium, so get the government out of the way. This sets the rules. Okay. Messing with money supply, just to screw things up, as we talked about. Speed increasing it or decreasing it causes some people headaches. Increasing it causes one group headaches, decreasing it causes other group headaches. Same thing when you mess with interest rates, same thing when you mess with spending. So they just say, just classical say the government should help business. Kinsey say the government should help people. Monitors say the government should just get out of the set of the rules and get out of the way. We hate it when we watch a football game and the refs make some calls that determine the outcome of the game, not the players. They're saying, let the players play. Sets the rules. If our population is growing by 3% each year, well, let's increase money supply by 3% each year, so then things are going to be even. Yeah. Let's increase government spending by 3% each year, so everything will be even. Set some rules and leave them and have them be automatic. If the population is only 2%, well, we only increase money supply by 2%. We only increase the uh, Social Security benefits by 2% equal to the inflation rate. What just sets the rules to go with it? Everybody's gonna know what to expect, everybody's gonna know how to plan, and everything will be pretty sure. Yeah, it is. you may not get as fast to growth as you could, but you're not gonna get as slow a slowdown as you would get. You lose the highs, you lose the lows, sort of steady and boring. This is the C student here. And I'm okay with that. As opposed to the student that gets an A on one test and B on the other one. You, know, you get the highs, you get the lows, and monitors should be like slow and steady when you race. What's that catch? Uh, catch is this is the money supply and interest rates are only part of you, part of the thing. And oh, shoot, hit the wrong button. Um, oh, uh, no.